Father's love everyone and welcome as always. Today we're going to do commentary on John 11 by F.B. Meyer. So sit back, relax. Let's get into some commentary. <clears throat> John 11 verses 1 through 16. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. <clears throat> Sickness enters homes even where God is honored and loved. It is permitted because it affords an opportunity and platform for His delivering help. We should see to it that the Son of God is glorified in our physical weakness, either because of our patience and fortitude, which are ministered by His Spirit, or by the deliverances which He grants. See Colossians 12, 1-9, 2nd Colossians, or 2nd Corinthians 12, 1-9, sorry. There is a special emphasis on therefore in John eleven six, 6, which reads, When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Christ lingered because he loved. He allowed the worst to go to the worst that the sisters and the world through them might receive a testimony to his saving power, which could be obtained at no less cost than their brother's death. John 11, 9, which reads, Jesus answered, Are not twelve hours in the day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. As long as the heart is bathed in the light of God's presence, and is conscious of living on his plan, it cannot be mistaken in his decisions, and it will not stumble. Our Lord knew that he must go to Bethany, and that he would also be safe, because the hour of night had not arrived. Since Jesus came to us, death has become a mere shadow of its former self, and is to be dreaded no more than sleep. Had the Lord been beside his dying friend, he could not have forborne the entreaty of the sisters. But now there was room for a faith-compelling miracle on his part. John 11, 17-27 Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, 
as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. His step may linger, but Jesus comes at length. While he seems to tarry, he knows each sigh, pang, and tear that escapes from the sufferer and his friends. And when he arrives, he does more than we asked or thought. He raises not the sick, but the dead. He makes the darkness of the tomb the background to set forth the resurrection glory. He turns tears into jewels, as the sun does with dewdrops. In after days, the three would not have wished it otherwise. They would review it all as we show our life from the hilltops of heavenly glory with the cry of Amen, Hallelujah. Amen, the reverent ascent of the will, Hallelujah, the glad ascription of praise. If we die before his second advent, we shall still live. If we live to see it, we shall be changed in a moment into his likeness. Note that majestic consciousness of I am in John 11:25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. None ever spoke like this. It is the crown of the eight I am's of the gospel. He is unchangeably the same. All who have lived are living still in him. When you stand by the grave where your cherished hopes lie buried, still dare to affirm that he is the Christ, the expression of the love of God. John 11, 28-35 and when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. <clears throat> it is not to be wondered at the sisters and their friends wept as they stood beside the grave. But why did Jesus weep? He knew what he had come to do. He had come for the express purpose of turning their tears into joy. He wept for human frailty. The man's life 
is in hand breadth and his years as a tale that is told. He wept in sympathy with human sorrow because he realized that the scene in which he was taking part was a sample of myriads more. He groaned as in John 11:33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. As he beheld the evidences of death's grim power. Death had entered the world with man's sin, and Jesus felt the wrongfulness of Satan's usurpation. The anarchy that had invaded human life stirred his soul to its lowest depths. The wrong under which man bled brought in him an anger which was without sin. He still stands among our groups of mourners touched with the feeling of their sorrow. But they are not tears of weak sentiment but of a noble pathos that hastens to help with a divine sufficiency. It has also been suggested that Jesus wept because he was calling a soul back from the land of glory to sojourn once more in the garments of mortality. <clears throat> John 11, 36 to 44. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee, that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. <clears throat> the Lord had been praying about this matter before he came to the grave. He, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Notice the past tense. Perhaps he had done so when he first received the news of Lazarus' sickness. He had prayed and had received the assurance that his prayer was answered. When he started back across the Jordan, it was with the full assurance that Lazarus would be raised to life. He was conscious also of a life of unceasing prayer. There was an unbroken and constant cooperation between him and the Father. He always did the things that pleased God, and God was always answering him. This also might be our constant experience. Christ made this prayer to those who stood around, as they saw the effect of prayer, should understand that prayer alone can work great miracles, which become the credentials of Christ and all who love and obey him. His people, his people similarity can do great miracles as missionaries, Christian workers, and philanthropists. 
John 11, 45 to 57. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment, that if any man knew where he were, he should shew it, that they might take him. <coughs> Excuse me. The friends of the family who had come to lament with them were disposed toward Jesus and believed, but the mere spectators hastened with the news to inflame the hatred of the Pharisees. The Romans dreaded the power acquired by permanent office and often exchanged one high priest for another, hence the expression being high priest that year. By his vote, Caiaphas may be said to have appointed and sacrificed his victim, who in that memorable year was to bring in everlasting righteousness and to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, as we read in Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for the iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. And Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Caiaphas, Caiaphas professed to fear that Jesus would presently gain such an ascendancy over the people as to lead a revolt against Rome, which would cause a deluge of blood in which the whole nation would perish. Therefore, he recommended that they should compass the death of Jesus. But, as the evangelist puts it, he spoke more widely and truly than he knew, because the death of Jesus is gathering into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. That is, the heathen who were living up to their light, as in John 10:16, which reads, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That of the twain he might make one new man.
As always, I hope that truly blesses each and every one of you who heard it. I apologize. I've uh, been dealing with a very bad toothache for four days now, and I hope the reading came through okay. Uh, I ask for your continued prayers for the children of the world, for our fellow brothers and sisters. I ask that you continue to shine your light in the darkness wherever you go, spreading the love of the Father and His Son and our Savior, Jesus. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. I'll see you next time.